Good morning, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. Um, I thought um, I would stop, drop by here on my way to Hawaii. Don't get mad at me, but when we leave here, uh, we are headed to the airport. This coming Thursday, um, I will celebrate 50 years on the planet, so half of the time that Viola's been in existence. And I thought if I got to turn 50, I might as well do it on Waikiki Beach. So um, that's where we're headed. Very spiritual assignment. Pray for us uh, when we leave here. I want, to, um, I want to spend this time talking to you about your divine design. Your divine design. I thought um, that I wanted to share with you who are God's leaders that are emerging today with the task of sharing the light and love of Christ with a godless generation, I thought it's important for all of us to understand that God is at work in every one of us in the room. One of, the, one of my passions as a pastor and radio teacher is to help the body of Christ understand that God doesn't have big eyes and little U's in the kingdom. All of us play a very, very significant role in what God is doing. The passage that I want to leave with you is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Now, a lot of us are familiar with Ephesians 2, verse 8. But I want to share with you verse 10, which houses the, uh, the, the passion of my heart today. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 8, says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is one of my favorite passages. I've been in this book uh, most of my life. I got saved Uh, young, and I've been in the Word of God for most of my life. And of all of the passages I love in the Scriptures, this is certainly in the top ten. And it's because I came to discover some years ago that there was significance to my salvation beyond me. When you are saved, you're told in verses 8 and 9, it's a work of God. You're saved by grace which is unmerited favor. We could not save ourselves. Therefore, the Lord in his love reached down and saved us. It is a work of grace. It is a gift of grace. And we can never boast about our salvation. All we can do is worship and glorify God for it, which is why worship, by the way, should never be a task for a child of God because all you got to do is think about the fact that were it not for God's love, you would be hopelessly lost with absolutely no remedy to your sin. And God in his love reached down and saved you. So you shouldn't have to be worked up to worship. All you got to do, the old song says, is think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you, and it ought to evoke worship. But this is a work of God that's happened in us. But one day I discovered verse 10. I never heard a lot of preaching about verse 10 when I was coming along, but verse 10 jumped out at me years ago and has been with me ever since. We are God's workmanship. That is to say, God began to do something intentional when he saved every one of us. The fact that you are in the kingdom of God is a sign that God has you as a construction project, and he is up to something in your life. And we are God's workmanship, we're told, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, and here's the part I love, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God knows right now what he wants out of you before you leave the planet. And I've come to tell you that there is a purpose for your living. You are here by design. I don't care what your parents told you. You are not an accident. You are here by design design. God knew what he wanted out of you, so he brought you to the planet, saved you 
by his grace. And right now, he is in the process of bringing to pass his will. But it is important that we understand there is a role we play in the process. It is a work of God that has begun in us, but we must then take up the responsibility to do some things that the Bible calls us to do. First of all, the Bible calls us to love God. If you want to fulfill your divine design, job one is to be a lover of God. I love Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, when Jesus was answering the Pharisees, and they had asked him, what is the greatest commandment? Of course, they were trying to trap him. But Jesus was able to elude any trap that was ever set for him. And they tried to trap him, but Jesus used it as an opportunity to preach a message that they would never forget. He said, oh, without hesitation, he said, the greatest commandment is this. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. He referred them to the book of the law, to, to Deuteronomy, to the books of the law, to the Pentateuch. And he said, God commands us to love him. I love the fact that love of God is a command, not a suggestion. If you want to fulfill your divine design, decide that I will be a fulfiller of this command, which is to love God. God doesn't suggest that we love him. He doesn't say it would be a good idea if you fell in love with me. God says, I command you to love me. How in the world can somebody command you to love him? Try to do that with the person you like on campus and see how far you get. How in the world do you command somebody to love you? Well, you can do it if you're God. If you're God, you can say, I'm at the top of the chain. I am the sovereign. There is none higher than me. There is no court of arbitration you can go over my head to. And therefore, I have a design for your life. And it begins with you living your life in sync with that design. So you need to love me. God says, I command you to love me. You see, Jesus is Lord. He's not trying to be Lord, hoping to be Lord, encouraging us to get out to vote so we can vote him in as Lord. Jesus is Lord. That, I love my job as a preacher because I get to just be emphatic. You know, so many folk, you have to be real diplomatic in what you do, you know, and, and try to smooth and, and make people feel comfortable. No, no, I get up and tell folk what the book says. And the book says Jesus is Lord. Get with the program. Jesus is Lord. He's not trying to be Lord, hoping to be Lord. He is Lord. You don't believe me? One day, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. I love running into these folk who, who think they have the privilege of trying to make up their mind about whether they believe Jesus. I tell them, well, you don't have a lot of time to get your mind made up because he's coming again. And when he comes again, every knee will bow. The question is not whether you will bow to his lordship. The only question is when. You bow now and you enjoy his blessings and his favor and his salvation and you enjoy living by divine design. But if you don't bow now, believe me, my friend, you will bow. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So since I discovered that he is Lord, then it makes sense for me to submit to his lordship and to fulfill the great commandment, which is to love him with all of my heart. I want to encourage you to be a lover of God. Life goes right when you love the author of life. And so the first responsibility we have who are the products of divine design is to love God. And don't we have every reason in the world to love God? God has been so good to every one of us. That you are sitting here today is proof positive of the love of God for your life. 
You could have been wiped out a long time ago. You could have been anywhere but here. You could have been strung out in all kinds of sin and degradation in your life. Oh, I know you got trials and situations and you got a little dysfunction in your family. Welcome, take a ticket. Welcome to the planet. You know, you, you, got, you, you got some problems and some issues. But the bottom line is every one of us, God has been good enough for you to this point in your life for you to never run out of praise for what he has done for you. And the fact is, you haven't seen anything yet. The best is yet to come. So we have every reason in the world to love God. If you want to live by your divine design, you want to be a lover of God. And then secondly, you want a purpose to give God a return on his investment in you. This passage in Ephesians 2 suggests that God has deliberately invested in your life. When it says we're his workmanship, it means God is building some things into your divine design. He knows what he wants out of you, and he is building some things into your life. And I want to encourage you to, to prepare and to plan to give God a return on his investment in you. I love what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse uh, 12, he says uh, somewhere in that verse, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Then verse 13 says, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know what that means? That means God put some things in you, now he calls you to work them out of you. He built it into you, it's part of the design of your life, but you have got to work out what God has worked in. God has some things going on inside of you that are meant to come out of you. In fact, you are on the planet so that those things can be expressed to the glory of God. You say, how do I discover? One of the questions I get the most um, is, uh, what, how can someone know God's will for your life? I say, well, it's not that mysterious. If you want to know what God wants out of you, look at what God put into you. God does not want out of you what is not built into the design in the first place. You don't ask a computer to be a piano. It doesn't play music in and of itself. It's not built for that. You have a certain build. God knows what he wants in you. You don't have to pray about uh, recording CDs if you can't sing. You know, I just, well, does God want me to be a singer? Well, can you sing? No. No, he does not want you to be a singer. Absolutely not. I guarantee you. Have you ever seen anybody persecute a group with a solo? Sometimes people try to sing and they don't have that gifting, that ability. It's not what God wants out of them. You ever heard somebody preach who's not called? Oh, my Lord. You'd rather have a root canal than to endure a sermon from somebody not called to preach. We've got to find our divine design, and it's not that tough. If you want to know what God wants out of you, look at what God put into you. Let me give you some keys real quick, A through G. A, ask God. You want to know what, uh, how to give God a return on his investment? Ask God. Don't ask everybody else without asking God. Don't spend time asking preachers and professors and, and chaplains and what have you, what does God want out of my life? Are you talking to the one who built you, who designed you? Talk to the designer. He can tell you about the design. Ask the Lord to reveal his plan and purpose. Ask the Lord to reveal the giftings, the strengths, the abilities he's placed in you. Ask God to reveal the calling because your calling is going to be the key to your fulfillment. Believe me when I tell you, your vocation will not necessarily be the key to your fulfillment. It is your calling. It's because you're called to do some things for the kingdom. It may be in sync with your vocation. Sometimes you have the blessing of having a calling that is directly related to a vocation. But you'll find in Scripture people who both had a calling and a vocation together, and you'll find people who were uh, by vocation one thing just to pay the bills and kind of make ends meet, but then their passion was what they did about their calling. Your calling, your, your vocation is what you're paid to do, but your calling is what you're made to do. And I want to encourage you to spend your time praying about what you are made to do, because that's where your fulfillment's going to come from. Ask God. B, 
burdens. Look at the burdens that are on your heart as you, as you move through your college years and, and as you uh, work in, uh, you know, internships or whatever it is God would have you do during this season in your life. Uh, perhaps you get involved in your local church as ministries or whatever it is, or you volunteer with some missions or parachurch organizations. Sooner or later, you are going to come upon some burdens in, in your life. You're going to see some things that deeply concern you, and you'll have some burdens that you can't just pray about. There will be some things that you feel compelled to do something about. Often your burdens are an indication of your calling. Such was the case with Nehemiah in the Old Testament. He had a burden about the wall. A lot of folks saw the wall of Jerusalem was burned and, and destroyed, and they said, oh, what a shame. But Nehemiah didn't just have that, oh, what a shame mentality. He said, I've got to do something. Look at your burden. C is, is the principle of conferral. Notice what has been conferred upon you by, through the words of others, the admonition of others. Notice what prayerful people have said to you. Uh, listen, pay attention when people who talk to God speak to you because often they have a sense of what God is doing in your life even when you don't have such a strong sense. I grew up, I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid, and I grew up with people patting me on my head saying, you're going to be just like your father. And, and I thought, I am not. I didn't want to be a preacher. I ran from being a preacher. Oh, how I did not want to preach. I had plans for my life, and they did not include a pulpit. But I found out Jesus was Lord, and he, would, he wasn't asking me what I thought about it. But these people, the point is, as I grew up, there were some people who saw God's hand on my life before I knew what I would be involved in. Pay attention when prayerful people talk to you about the things that the Lord is showing them about your life. D, dreams. Examine your dreams. You remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph was 17 years old when the Lord gave him two very significant dreams, both of which were direct indications of what God was going to do in his life. He dreamed that in, in a couple of different ways that he would one day be in a place of prominence and his very family would be bowing to him. He didn't know when the dream would be fulfilled. He didn't know where the dream would be fulfilled. But he did sense that this is from God. Pay attention to the dreams that are in your heart, whether they're things you dream at night or, more importantly, the dreams that you see with your eyes wide open, the things that are in your heart. The ministry I am, I am, I am doing now in the Bay Area, I dreamed about as an associate pastor in the 1980s in my hometown of Philadelphia. And as I was working in someone else's ministry, helping my senior pastor to fulfill his vision, God was giving me dreams in my heart of one day pastoring a church that would grow very large, that would reach unchurched people, that would be unchurchy in style, but it would be very biblical and sound in substance. And there was this dream in my heart, and I knew it was from God. I didn't know when it would be fulfilled or where it would be fulfilled, but I knew it was a God thing. Pay attention, pay attention to the dreams. E stands for exposure. Watch the exposure that God gives you because there will be what I call divine appointments that God gives you from time to time. God will have you at the right place at the right time to meet the right people for the right reasons. Divine appointments. So watch what God exposes you to. Watch the people he crosses your path with. Watch the ministries he exposes you to. And you will begin to see that there is purpose in some of the movements of God in your life. Exposure. Exposure is an important principle because some things are caught, not taught. Some things are caught, not taught. I've caught some, some of my passion for ministry by God exposing me to certain people. I caught my passion for winning souls by being exposed to Billy Grahams and, and Greg Lorries and people who are, who are effective in reaching the loss. And, and, and I've, many of, of the things that are going on in my ministry today are because of some strategic divine appointments God has given me along the way. Pay attention to the principle of exposure. F stands for faith. F stands for faith. I won't spend a lot of time now because that is my final point as I close here in a few moments. But F, F simply means that we must be people of faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It is the operating system of the child of God. It is what drives your life as a child of God, living by faith. 
and therefore, and faith is very active. Faith is not passive. Faith, when the Bible speaks of faith, living by faith, it's not talking about living by merely a set of beliefs, but it's, it means acting on those beliefs. Living with the confidence that those beliefs are completely true and I am willing to lay down my life in order to fulfill God's plan for my life. If you want to get a snapshot of, of walking by faith, Look at what Peter did that night when he was on the boat in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm. He and the disciples were in big trouble, but they look out on the water and they see Jesus, who at the moment didn't have a boat, access to a boat because they had the only boat. And so Jesus had to rescue them, and he'll, and he'll get to you by any means necessary. So he started walking on the water. And they looked out and saw that, and Peter said, man, as if it's not bad enough that we're out here about to drown, now a ghost has come out here. And Jesus said, don't fear, it's me. And the Bible says that uh, Peter said, if that's you, Lord, bid me to come. And you know what happened. The Lord said, come. Now, Peter could have believed he could walk on water in that moment, but it wouldn't have done him any good unless he got out of the boat and got down into the water, and that's exactly what he did. Living by faith is getting out of the boat. Don't tell me, don't, don't write books on, on, on I believe I can walk on water. Get out of the boat. Don't theorize about it. Actually live it out. Walk by faith. And G stands for gifts. If you want to know what God has done in you, look at the gifts he's given you, both the spiritual gifts and the natural abilities. They are directly linked to your calling. So love God. You want to fulfill your divine design, love God. Secondly, purpose to give God a return on his investment in you. And third, walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says that's what we do. We who are God's people, we walk by faith. Let me tell you something. You will not get very far in the divine design process as long as you are tied to what you see, think, and feel. You have got to get to the place where you're willing to let God be God and you are willing to, with reckless abandon, trust him with your very life and your very future. And if God says it, you do it. You don't think about it. You don't wonder about it. You do it. God tested me on that point very, very, uh, very, very significantly in 1989 when he told me to leave my home church in Philadelphia, all of my family and friends, go across the country to the Bay Area, leave a nice church where I'm the associate pastor, good salary, everything's good, to go to 34 people in the Bay Area to live up there with all that high cost of living and housing. And he said, that's where I will fulfill what I put in your heart to do. And we had to get in our car and go. Well, actually, I got in the car, and then I flew them out afterwards because I wanted to drive fast. She wouldn't have let me. So I drove across the country and flew them out. And 18 years ago, I told 34 people, God is going to grow a church of thousands. I don't know how many thousands, but thousands and thousands. Most of them are going to be unchurched by background. We're not here to trade members with other churches. This isn't the MBA. I'm not swapping three deacons for four choir members. I'm here to win the lost. you got to help me win the lost. we got to pray and fast and believe God for a harvest. And uh, we got a mission field all around us. These days, if you want to do missions work, you don't have to necessarily get on a plane. we got heathens and pagans all around us. We live in an unchurched society. We might as well get out of denial and realize it. These folk don't go to church around us. If they do, they're CEOs, Christmas and Easter only. So we got a lot of work to do, and I told these folks, God's going to raise up thousands and thousands. And I preached that message to them until they believed it. And it took a while of praying and fasting. We sowed for years in tears. Years we prayed and fasted and begged God for souls with very few results. Our church grew from 34 to about 250 in seven years. And I thought, that's good growth by average growth standards, but by the burden that was on my heart and, and the dream I had from God, this is not it. Lord, did I mess up? Did I miss my calling? What happened? One of the things you'll learn about God is God will tell you what he's going to do in your life but won't give you any idea as to when he'll do it because he'll make you walk by faith. And he taught me to love souls enough to pray and cry for them and believe for them. And, uh, and we did that for years. And for seven years, we did that with very few results. 
but we stuck to it and just believed God. And in the eighth year, I don't know why God chose to do it, but in the eighth year, suddenly something broke. And in the first seven years, it was a happy coincidence when people got saved in our church. I mean, it was just surprising to me. I'd give an altar call and somebody would actually come. I'd say, are you, are you kidding? You really want to get saved? Yeah, come on down. Cool. It was a happy coincidence. For seven years, I never knew if it was going to happen. And it only happened a few times. In the eighth year, something broke because I was living by divine design. And we had prayed and believed God and, and hunkered down and said, this is it. Sink or swim, we're going to believe God. And in the eighth year, something broke. And ever since then, there hasn't been a weekend, not a weekend in our church that people haven't come to Christ for years now. Not a weekend that people haven't come to Christ. Often five and seven and ten and twelve a weekend. Sometimes more. You say, what was the difference? Well, what, what did you start preaching differently? Well, whose book did you read? It, it wasn't about any of that. In fact, I spent the seven years reading books trying to figure stuff out. After that, I said, Lord, I'm just going to stick with your book and wait and see what you're going to do in my life. And God turned it around. And he pulled a surprise, too. I thought I was going to pastor a black church because I'm a black guy, as you can see. <laughs> and, you know, most churches in America are, you know, one racial group is, you know. And I assumed when the Lord told me I was going to reach thousands, I assumed it would be thousands of black folk. You come to our church today of nearly 6,000 members, almost 50%, 40-some percent are non-black. The most amazing thing I've ever seen. I said that. Well, you know, when it first started happening, my first two white members joined. You know, I thought it was cute. <laughs> you know, I thought it was cute, but beyond that, I didn't understand what was happening. I was like, okay, cool. I got some white folk, cool. You know. You know I, I told, I called my black pastor friends. Man, I got two white folk in my church. You know. But then they kept coming, and Asians came, and Hispanics came, and Pacific Islanders, and East Indians, and, and today our church looks like the United Nations. <laughs> and they all come because the Lord drew them by his spirit, and they love his word, and they're committed to his will, and they're learning to be fully devoted followers of Christ. And it's all part of the divine design. And God has a divine design for your life. I don't know what it is. You'll have to discover that. But I can tell you, it's the key to your fulfillment. It'll make you more joyful and more content than any amount of money in the wrong field. Any pursuit that is not part of God's plan will not bring you the satisfaction of knowing you are fulfilling his divine design for your life. The goal, my friend, the goal of living is not to see how much you can earn. If God blesses you with a high income, high income, praise God. Use it for his glory. God's not against money. He's against people being hung up on money. Money can be a great blessing. As a pastor and as a radio minister, I no longer fight money. Money is good. It's the love of money that is the root of all kinds of evil. But money dedicated to God can get his will done. But money is not the key to your fulfillment. The key to your fulfillment is living by divine design. Love the Lord with all your heart. Purpose to give him a return and to work out what God has worked in and walk by faith. One day, you will fulfill his divine design for your life. I want to close with prayer. And listen, I, I want to ask you, if you have a real desire to know God's will, maybe that's been a point of prayer for you, um, you're in that place where you're saying, God, I, I want to know what my major ought to be and more importantly, where I'm going. When I get where I'm going, Lord, where will, where will I be? If that's your desire, I want to include you in this prayer and ask God to make it clear to you. And then I want you to go from here today fully committed to living by divine design. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your presence and in your word. I thank you for every one of my brothers and sisters who's in this room right now. I thank you for these young people and what you're doing in their lives. You have begun a good work in them. Now, I ask you, Lord, in the name of Christ, that you would be active in each of their lives, re-preaching these truths, helping them to understand that they are creatures of divine purpose. You've got something you want to work out of them. I pray that you'd make us sensitive to your calling, give us a passion and a love for you, 
that will take us through the rest of our lives so that one day, having fulfilled your divine design, we'll all hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. We ask it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks for hanging in here with, this, with us this morning. God bless you.